Good morning, campers, and welcome to Radio Camp Half-Blood, a Percy Jackson read-along podcast. I'm B, And I'm Zach. And this week, we read The Titan's Curse, Chapter 9, I Learn How to Grow Zombies. Yes, it's one of those things where, you know, you have to give plenty of love, maybe listen to a couple death metal albums, maybe some mega death, and you give it some love, nurture affection, and then the zombies should possibly sprout in a couple weeks, unless there's a drought. Oh. There has to be um a cute little watering can. I think that that's a pretty helpful accessory. <laughs> Isn't there a cute little watering can in this chapter? No, yeah, there literally is. There's literally a cute little watering can. <laughs> That's not even a joke. Unless it's like the great zombie famine of 2009. Yeah, the blight. It was. It really affected the zombie crops. It was very sad. It was very sad. George Romero that year was very disappointed in the yield. <laughs> <laughs> so, B, what did you think of this chapter? A lot of spooky stuff happening in this chapter. I have a lot of questions. A lot of questions were raised. Very few were answered. Other than, I guess, maybe the zombie in the... The zombies mentioned in the chapter title are literal, but they're like very specific, weird sort of zombies that we'll kind of get into. B is as if, you know, they were sowing uh, more questions that need to be answered later on. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's probably what's happening right now. There's so much going on. I feel like there's so much going on plot wise. There's I can't even like grab all of the plot threads necessarily like oh right then there's the whole thing with annabeth and then you have to keep in mind that luke is still something's happening with him but then there's like this general guy who's like working for chronos but where is chronos there's just a lot happening that i i think there, a lot's being set up that isn't isn't going to be answered for a while anyway not until the end of this book chronos is just in his spooky sarcophagus still he has to have everyone else do his bidding for him until you know he rises to full power I imagine he's, like, already alive, and they just open the sarcophagus, and he's playing, like, his Nintendo Switch or something. <laughs> he's like, hey, guys, what's up? Well, to be fair, the god of time lives on the procrastination. Yeah, right. He's just, like, he could just do whatever he wants because he can control time, so he's, like, hanging out. They just open the sarcophagus, and he's just like, five more minutes. <laughs> I want to beat this one level. Even in Harry Potter, we had, you know, Voldemort didn't come back until about the fourth book, which, you know, you have to build him up now that we have his cronies. Crony. We have this general. We have uh, Dr. Thorne. We have Luke. We have these crazy snake women. You have to, like, build him up. He has to be the big bad guy. You can't just start off with the big bad villain. What is this, Batman versus Superman with having Doomsday? Oh. Oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that it's definitely, like, a narrative choice to try and, like, build up what Kronos is going to be ultimately. There's just a lot of like spooky allusions to what's going to happen with that, but you don't really fully understand. There's just like a lot of hinting about like, oh, there will be a great war and I will create thousands of troops for Kronos. And like, I guess we get more details as to like what their plan is because lucky for Percy, he walks in and he like immediately overhears just a bunch of planning happening in very explicit non-coded terms. Well, that's the great thing about, like, evil villains, they get monologuing, which is the best in anything, especially in, like, a movie like James Bond, where that's, like, a staple of just, I'm the villain, so I have to give you my plan while I put you in a death-defying thing, which you could easily break out of. Yeah, like, they they don't speak in any vague terms, they're just incredibly specific when they talk. Well, we'll we'll get into that. I think the point is, is that Percy is invisible, so why would they not speak very frankly? Oh, I guess that's true. But I feel like, I don't know, I would be more skeptical of, like, spies or someone listening in. Or even so, like, if you were planning something so intense and the stakes are so high, they're trying to, like, take over the world, basically. It just seems really funny the way they're just like, and anyway, I am the head commander of Kronos' army. Like, they just, like, state a lot of things that everyone in the room would already know. Well, I... I mean, Rick Riordan isn't a man of subtlety. I mean, we did have a chapter last book about a civil warship blowing up (laughs) the sea of monsters almost. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised by that. And it is kids books. You have to like kind of take things with a grain of salt and go, okay, well I guess he has to spell out some 
exposition stuff or else like Percy would just never know anything and we would we would all be in the dark because we know what Percy knows basically like he's the point of view character we talked a lot about this in the last episode you know if Percy can't get certain bits of information then there's no way for the audience to get that information unless there's hints that he's not picking up on that we would maybe understand better but for the most part like you need to have that stuff spelled out the hardest part about like writing kids media especially like writing villains is the fine line between spoon feeding your audience and just like making things that are implied because a lot of kids, this might be their first time reading like a serious chapter book. So it's like one of those fine lines where you either have, you have to lay out the plan or you leave it in the point of view of Percy, who is an idiot. No offense to Percy, but like Percy's yes, not like, necessarily an idiot. He's sometimes pretty like, I don't know, quick to pick up on things, but it depends on the circumstance. When I mean by idiot i mean like he's kind of like ignorant on certain things like the audience because that is our viewpoint character yeah exactly and he's also just newer to this world he doesn't know like all the mythological lore as well as other campers for instance so a lot of times he's he's way worse at like sort of guessing what's happening based on mythological knowledge like i mean i guess that's sort of what we were talking about too in our last episode about how i try to avoid some mythology things because that can almost spoil some of the plot points here and it's it's funny because percy's inherently the same way because he's not actually like the greatest student so he doesn't always know like oh what is this mythological creature how do i defeat him a lot of the times he doesn't have that information at the ready Here's like the catch 22. Like, there's two ways of doing this. I'm actually re watching Game of Thrones getting prepped for the last season. Uh, one thing that Game of Thrones does is they like just throw you into the world and they like might bring something up and then you don't know what they're talking about until you either reread it or it's like 30 episodes or books down the line. Like, they bring it up and then later on you're able to like fill in the pieces because they're not going to like spoon feed it to you because there isn't a character that's like the Luke Skywalker insert who doesn't know anything. Uh, whereas in Percy Jackson, he's more of the hero insert. Like Luke Skywalker, it's like he, people are going to explain the force to him, like what the Empire is, all these things. And that's kind of like one of the hard parts about it. We talked about this a lot with the first book with Lightning Thief because he, obviously he's super new to that. But we, I guess you have to keep in mind that even though that this is the third book, he still is pretty oblivious about a lot of things. And so it's helpful to have him in that position to be constantly learning either because people go oh right i have to explain you these things like even just like the scene that happens in this chapter with um with mr d also we get like some backstory about him so there's like a lot of opportunities for people who just explicitly explain things they're like oh you're an idiot of course you wouldn't know this but then also you know sometimes circumstances happen where percy will like be spying or something and then they'll they'll speak in a way that's like maybe a bit obvious but that's helpful yeah that's where the james bond comparison comes into where the villain doesn't need to speak so like obvious almost it's almost to the point of absurdity yeah yeah i mean i think i think it's fine it also works with just sort of like the archness of the villains we're dealing with like they seem pretty they're scary but they're pretty silly so far like they're just like i'm very intense and scary looking and i'm going to very dramatically state what i'm going to do like i don't know like that's just the kind of villain that we're dealing with so it makes sense that they would act that way the way that you look at these villains is that they're people that have been long forgotten so of course the second they're able to be remembered and they're like back into existence of course they're gonna gloat because back in the old days they were like the hip of the hip, like, I'm a manticore. I'm, like, half scorpion, <laughs> lion, dragon, nightmare, OC. Like, there's, like, things, like, when you think about, it, like, oh, obviously, like, they boast and stuff because they're stupid. Even, like, the general and, like, the idea of Luke is, like, what's the best way to put it? Like, he hasn't gotten his sea legs yet, and he's just dealing with these people that are, like, larger than life. Of course, he had that trap for Annabeth, and because of it, he's just, like, tired. He looks, like, 80 years older, and, like, he just looks weak and tired. But yet, uh, all the other people, because they're technically immortal in some way, shape, or form, like, they, they have no concept of what, like, being drained is like to a mortal. Yeah, I guess that's true, too. That would maybe change their personality, because they're just like, I'm unstoppable. We're both unstoppable. We're even better than Luke. Though, Luke, you did a great job, but we're going to be even better when with all of these soldiers. Well, okay, we're, we're jumping ahead a little bit. We're jumping the gun a little bit, but it's like one of those things when you keep in mind about talking about villains and how they talk, it's it's one of those interesting conversations because I love the way like villains are because normally they're a side of a story that you don't really normally get to have unless that 
unless like the author wants to talk about it, which there's some good books with good villains. And then there's one, and then there's some books with villains that are like one trick ponies. Uh, but we'll talk about that once we get to the villains. Yeah. Speaking of ponies, we get more Pegasus stuff going on in this chapter, at least in the beginning. Um, I really like, uh, I always forget his name, Blackjack. I like Blackjack. I think he's a funny character. I like that he insists on calling Percy boss all the time. I think that's like a cute detail. That he's like, all right, boss. He's like, please don't call me boss. He's like, okay, boss. Not a problem, boss. Oh, I'm so sorry, boss. Sorry, boss. Oh, it's like the person that's like, I'm sorry. Stop saying sorry. Oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry for saying sorry. Darn it, I'm sorry for saying that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's basically what's happening with Blackjack. He's just like a funny little character. I mean, we're not going to see more of him, I guess, because in the middle of the chapter, Percy's like, you can go home now. But I did like the little sort of fun stuff that we got to see with them interacting. And you could even see like how Blackjack is so dedicated to helping Percy because he's just like, oh, yeah, you're like my master. You're my boss because you're like the under the dominion of all of the horses. So it's funny how, like, sort of just willing to please he is. He's almost like a very enthusiastic, loyal dog. I don't think it's that, because this is just me and how I think, is that in Star Wars, the reason why Chewbacca hangs out with Han Solo is Han Solo saved him, so Chewbacca owes Han Solo a life debt. It's kind of the same thing here, because Percy freed, freed Blackjack from bondage. Oh, that there's that too, I guess, yeah. Well, there's like a couple things, because they could also communicate in a, a different way. But yeah, you're right. It's sort of like that cliche episode of like every TV show where like one character saves another character's life, and then they're like, I owe you a debt, and I'm going to follow you around and do anything for you. And that's kind of what's happening with Blackjack, where he just is constantly willing to please Percy in a way where it's like almost dangerous, and we kind of talk about that. Well, he almost like runs himself ragged to the point of dropping dead. Yeah, he's just like, I'll keep going. I'm fine. He's like really out of breath, which is, it's sort of a weird concept to think that a Pegasus could eventually get tired, because I'm thinking, oh, it's magic. It should never get tired, but I don't know what sort of logistics of that are. It's one of those things, B, where... Any regular horse or any creature will eventually run themselves ragged. Like, horses actually have a big problem of that, of just, like, you can push them to the point of where they just drop dead. Because they can't communicate with you and they don't really tell you all these things. Like, that's why people, like, oh, I ran my horse to near death. Which would be, like, really awkward if Percy was, like, flying in the air and just Blackjack just drops dead. Like, what what, what happened? The Percy with Jackson would just free fall? Oh, no, that's terrible. I find it kind of funny just, like, this whole scene with him because he's, like, there's some, like, weird comedic elements because of Blackjack who's just, like, so, you know, kowtowing to him and really just, like, their dialogue is really funny. Just, like, the way he definitely, he talks, like, um, he talks a lot like, like, Doug from Up. It reminds me of, like, she's, like, I, Squirrel. you're my best friend now. You're my master. I love you. I was hiding under your porch because <laughs> I love you. Like, that's kind of the vibe that he has, like, oh, I owe a debt to you. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. But then contrasted with that comedy is like Percy being like wait what the heck is this fan doing and he's trying to keep tabs on what the hunters are doing and then all of a sudden he realizes Argus isn't even driving the van it's Zoe and he's like oh well oh right this child who's actually a thousand years old knows how to drive I guess so in my head when I'm thinking about this when Zoe's driving there's like two scenarios it's either going to be like short rounds in Temple of Doom where she has like blocks on her feet or it's Bianca like at the pedals like putting the gas and the brake on while she's like drives the car <laughs> yeah just like doing some tokyo drift s- situations um yeah i just thought that was funny because you do forget how old zoe is because she's always described as looking so young like younger than most of the campers that we interact with in the series but then he's like oh right yeah she talks all old-fashioned because she's like thousands of years old but we don't exactly know how old especially in this chapter when they actually talk a lot about zoe and how old she is like how really old she is even mr d brings it up like she's older than like dirt yeah she says something i think about um because we do cut to their perspective at one point oh it's because percy overhears them but it's like them bickering about who can drive and zoe's just like oh i've been driving since the invention of cars so she's been around for a while at least at least like 100 years it it goes to show that you know the hunters of artemis will come out of the cave sometimes and like pick up things like the automobile or uh, just just imagine how happy they were when they found out there's you know compound bows and things that it can actually make hunting a lot easier yeah that's kind of interesting to, to see them use something like technological when you think of like the hundreds of artemis sort of separated from society but i guess they would be like oh those cars look helpful i guess we should probably learn how to drive those 
it's my favorite thing that I love to talk about. It's the idea, it's the concept of like you have like an old mythical character, and then you give him something modern like a gun, or you give him a car, like a wizard with like a like a Lamborghini. They're like, oh my god, this is so much easier! Wow, amazing! This is way faster than horses, which I guess Percy kind of learns because he's trying to keep up with traffic with a horse, even a magical horse, and like the, you know, Blackjack is like out of breath as he's like trying to keep track of what's happening with this van. B, now secretly I really want like a movie like The Fast and the Furious, both like wizards, but they have like their horses like Gandalf with like shadow facts and they're like Tokyo drifting. Yeah, yeah. he's just drifting the horse. <laughs> and the, the horse is going. <laughs> <laughs> Car crashes are way more exciting than horse crashes, I feel like. I feel like a horse crash would just be really sad to watch. Now I really, really want to see someone take the Fast and the Furious, like the first movie with the ending where they're trying to outrun the train, except with horses. Yeah, you'd never, <laughs> never really succeed on that, huh? Sort of a fool's errand. I'll never get that movie out of the ground, but one of these days we're going to have two horse, two furious. Two horse. Why are all of our jokes horse-based? Why does this, this keep happening? Well, B, we're very equestrian. Yeah, it's true. Well, I think maybe it just has to do with Percy Jackson because he's like very associated with horses because of Poseidon. So I guess that's why, I don't know. That's our justification for all the horse jokes. When you really come down to the nitty gritty, a lot of the Greeks used were horses and horse-based things because we have Chiron, we have horses, we have talking horses, we have Pegasuses. Yeah, we even have Hippocampi, which are essentially horses also because they're like sea horses. So really the Greeks were just like short versions of bronies and Pegasisters. Yeah, yeah, they're really, really into ponies. Um, so a weird thing happens where, like, the, I always, I completely actually forgot this happened in this chapter because it's such like a weird, sort of short exchange that happens where they're pursuing the van, and all of a sudden, Mister D shows up for a hot second and has like a whole weird conversation with Percy, and like has him wrapped with grapevines. I really like the imagery of this because Percy, you know, parks on the Chrysler Building because he's trying to get like a good vantage point, and this is actually the cover for. Uh, the Titans curse, at least the American version. Percy is, you know, stuck with the vines, with Blackjack, and you don't really know what's going on. And I like that because, again, even though we've come to believe that Mr. D doesn't care about anything, he actually does care about things. He has, we got his tragic backstory a little bit in this. And this um, is what kind of like where you, for me, this is where I kind of like appreciate Dionysus because he does care like a little bit, like if he really cared, like he'd be helping his kids. But here's the reason why he doesn't really care is it because he has a wife and he has he has a different life. And like you forget about, like, oh, punishments go both ways. I mean, I would imagine Dionysus is probably a good dad slash husband. Eh. Eh? Aren't really? You think that? <laughs> In my heart of hearts, I believe that. Okay, I don't. But whatever floats your boat. I don't think that he's a good dad. I don't. I think he's probably not a good husband. Well, I believe that in the sheer fact of that he could easily have just killed Percy. Or if you pay attention in this chapter, he actually says Percy's name right. He says Percy Jackson. It's kind of yeah, like there, it's like a weird exchange. Well, like let's try to like parse what happens exactly. So there's this thing happens with the grapevines. At first, I think oh, it's like Doctor Thorne or some other sort of big bad from the books. And then instead, it's Mister D, and he's like going somewhere. And then we think oh, okay, he's just there to bring Percy back because he wants to like punish him for disobeying the orders of the camp and saying that he can't go on this quest. Um, and then there's just sort of like this weird exchange where you think is he gonna kill him is he gonna bring him back to camp percy thinks that either could happen there's like this whole like monologue about how he doesn't like heroes it's kind of an interesting hang up that he has like he hates all heroes because they just sort of do whatever it takes to get what they want basically so like ends justify the means is sort of the logic behind a lot of heroes they'll just do anything even if it means sort of like you know chewing up and spitting out people along the way I mean, there's, like, logic in what Dionysus says because it's the point of, you know, he's trying to knock Percy Jackson down a peg because Percy Jackson is almost like he does what he wants because he can to the point of where there's no repercussions. Every time something he's done something without thinking, he doesn't realize there's going to be a repercussion, such as with Dr. Thorne and Annabeth, same as with Percy and his mom. Like, he's, he can do... He has carte blanche to do whatever he wants. I mean, don't forget, B... Percy's mom did murder Gabe. 
Like, sh- he can do whatever he wants. Like, even though Gabe was a terrible person, does he deserve to die? Yes. <laughs> yes, I believe so. He was abusive, though, right? There was, like, hints about that. He deserved what he got because of who he is. But it's, like, one of those things when it comes to, like, Dionysus, if you really think about the nitty-gritty of, like, his story and about his wife and why he's punished, the main reason why he hates these kids is because he just, he doesn't need to deal with them, really. He just, he hates them in the way that's just, like, he's put there because he doesn't want to be there because well, he Well, because it's a punishment. Some... Yeah. yeah it's, it's a punishment. Like, I guarantee you, if Dionysus was at Mount Olympus with his wife and all these things, he would be the cheery god that you, everyone imagines him to be. Because there's stories about Dionysus as well as, like, look at King Midas. Like, he's a fair man. Like, he gives him anything you touch turns to gold, except, you know, you take that literally because Midas was greedy. And because Dionysus cures him, and of course, King Midas is a jackass, so he gives him a pair of ass's ears as, you know, fit for the punishment. Like, there's certain things about Dionysus that I really do enjoy to the point of where he's very, he's just neutral to the point of where he he's lived millennia and he understands how people work to the point of where it's nauseating. He finds it hard to care, I guess, because he's seen people go on all sorts of quests and live and die. And it, it's, he's, yeah, he's desensitized in a lot of ways. Also, like you were saying, like, he doesn't just hate kids or i guess he hates the campers because they're heroes and what heroes represent like what he says to um to percy my point is you heroes never change you accuse us gods of being vain you should look at yourselves you take what you want use whoever you have to and then betray everyone around you so you'll excuse me if i have no love for heroes they are a selfish ungrateful loss lot ask adrian or medea for that matter ask zoe nightshade what do you mean, asked Zoe. He waved his hand dismissively. Go, follow your silly friends. So we not only get his weird backstory, but we get allusions to what happened with Zoe, too, because it's interesting. They both have kind of similar dislikes for heroes, but we don't exactly know. I mean, what, we found out the extent of what happened with uh, with Dionysus and his wife and everything like that, so that kind of makes sense why he doesn't like heroes. But we don't know Zoe yet. I, I imagine we're probably going to find that out pretty soon in this book. Which I like the story about how you know Dionysus met his wife because this is really great infotainment because not only is it like you're learning something about Dionysus, but it's actually furthering the plot and developing a character rather than, okay, history lesson, everybody, such as, you know, in Greek stories, they're not necessarily is ever a happy ending. Like, the, he tells him the story, and he's like, I'm not finished yet. Uh, I'll, I'll read this passage right now. They got married, I said, happy ever after the end. Dionysus sneered, not quite. Theseus said he would marry her. He took her aboard his ship and sailed off to Athens, halfway back on a little island called Nassox. That's that's what I'm going with. He, what's the word you mortals use today? He dumped her. I found her there, you know, alone, heartbroken, crying her eyes out. Uh, She had given up everything, left everything. She had given up everything, left everything. She knew behind to help a dashing young hero and tossed her away like a broken sandal. What's wrong, I said, but that was a thousand years ago. Uh, Mr. Deed regarded me coldly. I fell in love with Ariadne. Ariadne. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Deed reg- I don't care. <laughs> I healed her broken heart. And when she died, I made her my immortal wife in Olympus. She waits for me even now. I shall go back to her when I am done with this infertile century of punishment at your ridiculous camp. Yeah, so this is a real plot twist because then then Percy's like, I stared at him. You're you're married, but I thought you got in trouble for chasing a wood nymph. So it's sort of like this weird plot twist in his mind, like, oh, I had a completely different idea of who you were as a person and what your backstory was, and then the idea that out there somewhere is this wife that's waiting for Mister D, but this whole time he's being punished for like an eternity at this camp trying to take care of these heroes that he already regards as like selfish and uncaring. So I I could kind of see why he acts the way he acts even though I still am not the biggest fan of him as a character and I find him annoying. I understand why he acts this way. Quite essentially, he is like a DMV worker. Like he's just there day in day out putting in his time until he can go home to his wife 
which I just imagine like his wife is like on like a widow's peak or was it like a widow's walk? And she's just like waiting for him to come home every day. She counts, counts the seconds. Yeah. Like that one weird musical number in Pete's Magic Dragon. <laughs> Candle on the water. Yes. She's on the widow's watch and she's just looking out at sea for Dionysus. Yeah. Waiting for this kind of jerky guy, but it's fine. Whatever. I, d- I don't. Nothing accounts for taste, I guess. And then the weirdest thing happens is after all of this, he's like, all right, go find your silly friends. And then he like lets him go. I just like, I just wanted to give you a talking to and spook you out and tell you my sad backstory. And now you can go. Especially in the first book where, remember Dionysus's plan was, like, I'm just going to turn him into like a porcupine or something stupid. And I'm going to let him free in the woods. Like he even had plans of just like, I could turn you into a dolphin. I could turn you like literally into anything and I don't care. But here's just like, yeah, just go. I need you to go on this because I love his reasoning. His reasoning is the funniest. Maybe you might die on this quest and I don't have to deal with you anymore. You might die. Yeah, that's what he says. He says the prophecy says at least two of you will die. Perhaps I'll get lucky and you'll be one of them. But mark my word, son of Poseidon, live or die. You will prove no better than the other heroes. Very spooky phrase. And then he just snaps his fingers and disappears. So this is like a very interesting interaction because you kind of learn a lot and then you allude to other stuff with um with Zoe and then he's gone and you're like, what? OK. And I guess we have to go back to following Zoe and what's happening with the hunters. It's what I like to call like a drive by exposition where it's just like a fly by. Yeah, seriously. It's just, it comes out of nowhere. You get some new piece of information, like the wandering merchant in like a fantasy novel that brings news of the kingdom. And then he just walks away. And you're just like, wait, what What just happened? And it's too late. It like literally snaps his fingers. He's gone. You don't even have time to ask questions. The only thing that's left is, you know, the smell of like his grape farts. Yeah, probably. <laughs> oh, I forgot how gross Dionysus was. Uh, so what ends up happening is Percy Jackson like flies a little more because he finds the scent again, and they end up going towards Washington D.C. And I love the concern, which I ended up bringing up a couple of chapters ago when Thalia was flying the sun. It's like, wait, what happens if like, the army like catches whiff of this? Like, what what would actually happen? Like that scene in uh, Nightmare Before Christmas where they just like shoot down Jack Skellington, I'm pretty sure is what happens. I always love making scenarios in my head. There's like that one radar man who's like looking at the screen. He's like, we have like a bogey coming in. And like you like look at like the little screen and it's shaped as a horse. Yeah, they're like, wait a second. Is that a horse in the sky? It has wings. There's a little boy on top of it. I'm very confused. And then they scramble like the Harrier jets and they like fly right next to Percy Jackson and it's like, sir, we have a visual. It's a horse. A flying horse. Oh, okay. Like, in my heart of hearts, B, when it comes, like, they probably have to call, like, the U.S. general or whoever is in charge. And it just, it, it's just Ares. Like, he's that's just one of his side jobs. Right. That makes a lot of sense, actually. I could see Ares just actually being in, like, a high-level military position, like, undercover. I mean, he's the god of war, obviously. What better job to have? than to be a general in every, like, military branch in the United States. Uh, But what ends up happening is, you know, Percy Jackson's still invisible. Zoe, Thalia, Grover, and Bianca, like, sit down at a gas station for a little bit. So Percy's like, you know what, Blackjack? Go home before you die. Yeah. Here's some more exposition. I feel like most of this chapter is actually exposition because a lot of it isn't Percy directly interacting with anyone. It's just him spying or being talked at for the most part. And he's not because he just he interacts with Mr. D. Mr. D just sort of monologues at him for a little bit, disappears. Then here he's overhearing what's happening with um, Zoe and Grover and Talia and everybody. And they're obviously can't see him because he's invisible. And then later he'll run into the the villains that we're being introduced to. Um, and well, I guess the the new villain that is amongst the the collection of villains that we're amassing now in this story. Um, but either way, he's always just like listening in and sort of absorbing information and not really actively doing anything until the very end of the chapter. Especially with the interaction you hear with like Bianca and Thalia and how like they're fighting about stupid, pointless things. Because once again, Zoe Nightshade's the type of person that knows how to push people's buttons, especially Thalia. Yep, sounds about it. Which the greatest line of this book might actually be here. One of them, because there's another whole chapter that I love about this book that everyone possibly that has read further than you'd be knows. 
Uh, but my favorite part is, you know, they're talking about how she's driven an automobile since the invention of the automobiles. Like he gets confused by that. Like, wait, what? Yeah, and it, I just imagine like they they pull up, and she's like, "We need to get some petrol for our automobile." Yeah. Then uh, Percy thinks, uh, as Blackjack, Blackjack and I continued south following the van, I wondered whether Zoe had been kidding. I didn't know exactly when cars were invented, but I figured that was like prehistoric times, back when people watched black and white TV and hunted dinosaurs. <laughs> Percy, okay, maybe he is an idiot. <laughs> That's like my favorite line of dialogue, because quintessentially, that is the most kid thing someone has ever said in this book, like the most realistic thing. The interesting thing about, like, me just studying media and, like, looking at film and stuff is that the younger the generation is, the concept of, like, black and white, like, people won't watch black and white movies. You know know what the new retro is? Like, how we have old things now? What what do you think it is? To, like, a kid now, like, a teenager now, what do you think the concept of an old... The 90s (laughs) is considered old? No, like, scan lines on a VHS, like, having, like, like real wonky, like, it, like, goes up and down, like, there's, like, splits and pops and blips on the screen, like, having, like, old-timey, like, VCR, having, like, static snow. Now we live in an age where you could see a post on Tumblr where it's like, wow, I wish I was, like, a teenager when My Chemical Romance was still a band, and you're like, I'm a thousand years old. Yes, and that's the interesting thing about this is Percy Jackson... Obviously, he's a kid from the 2000s. Uh, His concept of old people is black and white before color was invented, obviously, and dinosaurs. Yeah. He doesn't even really understand. Because I remember telling my grandfather, this is not, it's it's like, you're so old that you probably had like a Flintstone car. Yep. Stuck his feet out. Yeah, he stuck his feet out. Put a Brontosaurus burger on there. I used to be terrible, and I used to tell my grandfather. (laughs) I used to be terrible. (laughs) Maybe I still am. Now you're slightly less terrible. <laughs> well, I know better now. Like, as a kid, I didn't understand like dinosaurs and old people like <laughs> never coexist. Yeah. Well, I mean, according to to certain misinformed uh, teachers at my high school, they thought that dinosaurs and people walked around together like the Flintstones, but they weren't exactly pretty well informed. I don't know. So anyway, around this time that we're catching up with um, Zoe and everybody, uh, Percy's starting to realize. That Blackjack's getting really tired. Like, he sees that they're crossing the Potomac River into central Washington. So he's like, okay, I kind of know where they're going. And I also, he, he starts to get, like we were saying, concerned about the military presence in D.C. And he's like, oh, well, I'm flying around on this pony that maybe might show up on radar or maybe not. But I don't want to take any risks. And also, uh, his Pegasus is, like, starting to really get exhausted. She's like, all right, Blackjack, you're really nice and everything, but you could just drop me down and you could go back to camp and graze and take some take some rest because you're pretty much exhausted. And this is also so he could get closer to um to the gang, I guess, to listen in on what's going on. Yeah, so what ends up happening is, you know, they're in D.C. Uh, the great thing about Bianca is, is, you know, she's from D.C. Like, that's like her home turf. Right, that's true. Um, and everyone's kind of mad at Grover, too, because he's taking them in this weird direction because that's where his, like, tracking skills are taking them, even though the prophecy says they're supposed to go west. So there's, like, a little bit of, like, a miscommunication of, like, where they're supposed to go. West? I thought you meant west. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so what ends up happening, B, is that they end up, Zoe, Thalia, Grover, and Bianca go to the Smithsonian, the greatest museum that ever existed and will ever exist. And yeah, just as Percy's trying to kind of get closer to them and figure out what's going on, he gets like a, a sort of spooky feeling and looks and sees this guy with gray hair and a military buzz cut. And he realizes that it's um Dr. Thorne and that he's been following them the whole time in this like creepy car. Oh no, Sacre Bleu. Yeah, exactly. So he kind of flips a coin in his head and goes, oh, well, I guess I should probably follow him and see what's happening with him, even though he wants to keep tabs on where the campers and the hunters are going. But he he makes the split decision and he inf- follows Thorne instead. They end up going to the Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. Though, it would have been even funnier if they went to the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Yeah, that would have been funny. I was thinking the same thing, actually. Um, sort of like a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge that Percy's spying. Have you ever gone to Washington, D.C.? Uh, yeah, I have, but I never went to the spy museum. I went to a lot of the other museums. I did go to the Smithsonian and the um, the Air and Space Museum and 
uh, a bunch of different like Smithsonian museums. And I think I went to the Holocaust Museum. That was very sad. There was I I think I all I did was just go to endless museums because it was a school trip. But I, for some reason, we didn't go to the spy museum. I think how recent is that? Because maybe I maybe it wasn't open at the time. I remember that was like a birthday present. Like I really wanted to go to D.C. because as a kid, I was a big nerd, big shock of all shocks. I wanted to go to all the museums like Air and Space, you know, the Natural History Museum, the International Spy Museum. And that was kind of like one of those uh, things. So this had to have been about 2006. Uh, They had the Spy Museum there still. And I wanted to go to the White House and do all that stuff. It was it was fun. I don't know. Is is the spy? Mu- I'm I'm guessing the spy museum's still there. Yeah, I think I was, I was just thinking about like how old I was when I went, or so. I don't know. Maybe, maybe just we couldn't fit, you know, that many things in at once. So anyway, it's funny that everyone sort of holed up in museums in this chapter because the they sort of split off. It's almost as if Rick Riordan wants all these kids in real life to go to these museums. It's kind of a sneaky thing. I didn't even think of that, but he's totally like, isn't it cool? All your cool favorite characters are going to all these educational museums. You might want to go there and learn a thing or two. By the way, if you see a handsome docent named Rick Riordan, you should say hi. Yep, yeah. That's totally exactly what he's trying to do, like make these museums seem cool. Um, It's really funny because, so the Museum of Natural History is where uh, Dr. Thorne sort of darts into, and it has a big sign that says, uh, closed for private event, but Percy, because of dyslexia, reads it as closed for pirate event. Or like he like walks in, actually, is a pirate event. Like he he thought his dyslexia was acting up, but it's actually true. And you actually see like a cutout of like Blackbeard. And, like oh no, it's the Queen Anne's Revenge. That would be a great twist, actually. Percy's just like seen it, been on it, saw it. Bye. Um. So yeah, he shows up, and a lot of spooky stuff is in this museum. A lot is going on. Yes, conveniently, they rented out the whole museum, which is really spooky because I thought, you know, that museum's open to the public. Yeah, so there's like, he walks in, he sees a dozen mortal guards, two monsters, reptilian women with double snake trunks instead of heads, or instead of legs. Uh, He'd seen them before. Annabeth had called them Scythian Draconae? Draconae? I don't know. Draconis? Draconae. Scythian Dracane, but that wasn't the worst of it. Standing between the snake women, I could swear he was looking straight down at me, was my old enemy Luke. He looked terrible. His skin was pale and his blonde hair looked almost gray, as if he'd aged ten years in just a few months. The angry light in his eyes was still there, and so was the scar down the side of his face, where a dragon had once scratched him, but the scar was now ugly red, as though it had recently been reopened. That's a really interesting characteristic because we see the main big bad guy, you know, Luke, who is quite essentially, you know, the big bad guy of these books so far. He, you see him in a, like being vulnerable to the point of where you almost feel sorry for him, but then you realize it's Luke, and you're like, eh, not really. Yeah, I wonder why his scar looks red again. Like, if it's just, like, being inflamed, like, a la Harry Potter or something. Like, he's just too close to the dragons or something. I don't exactly know why it looks that way, but... So, yeah, Dr. Thorne shows up, takes off his uh, spooky sunglasses underneath are his spooky two-colored eyes because heterochromia is scary. <laughs> no, B, it just means you're really cool and, like, really edgy because heterochromia and, like, emo scene kids is, like, the coolest thing ever. Having two eyes. Yep, exactly. Just put in one color contact. Oh, I remember that. I knew people that did that. Oh, I did, too. Yeah. Oh, there was also a kid who had, like, red contacts who was in my tech class. Kind of freaked me out. But this guy, I think he has real heterochromia, or or as real as a weird monster creature is. I don't know. It totally makes sense that he has this because, again, he's, like, a mishmash of creatures. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, when he's in his human form, he's going to have, like, a mishmash of weird attributes. Yeah, that that makes sense, actually. Um so yeah, kind of the gang's all here, except for Kronos, I guess, but there's um Luke, there's Dr. Thorne, and now we see the general, who's like, this voice that Percy was hearing in his dream, it's different than Kronos' voice, but he's like, working for Kronos. The description of him is pretty intimidating. Yeah, it's one of those unique things when it comes to having, you know, we have Luke, who is, again, like, one of the main staple villains, but then we have this general, who is like, the embodiment of evil. 
He's obviously more competent than Luke, for sure. Like, he seems like he knows what he's doing more so. He also has that, like, that villain trope of, like, whenever someone doesn't do something correctly, he's like, no, you you failed me. I You must die. I, I'm going to force choke you like uh, Darth Vader. You know what I mean? Like, he has that vibe to him where he, like, knows what he wants. And he ha- he's like, okay, if I have to get it done, then I'll have to do it myself. And he's way more commanding of a presence than Luke, who's sort of like this babbling sort of underling in comparison to him. Yeah, no, totally like this mysterious general is the person that's like, if you want something done, you do it yourself. But also he's the type of villain that, much like Darth Vader, like he would just kill you on the spot for talking smack. Yeah, the description of him is, um, I thought Thorne was scary when I first saw him in his black uniform at the military academy. But now, standing before the general, Thorne looked like a silly wannabe soldier. The general was the real deal. He didn't need a uniform. He was a born commander. I should throw you into the pits of Tartarus for your incompetence, the general said. I send you to capture a child of three elder gods, and you bring me a scrawny daughter of Athena. But you promise me revenge, Thorne protested, a command of my own. I am Lord Cronus's senior senior commander, the general said, and I will choose lieutenants who get me results. That's a really interesting thing, because it's the idea of Dr. Thorne. Even though he tried to kill Percy, like, do you think he'd want to capture him because it's either him or Thalia in that situation? I guess he only needs one of them alive. He just needs one of them, but they failed and they got um, Annabeth, who's not really what he wanted. So he's kind of like, oh, well, you failed me there. Um, There's a lot of sort of like power play happening with um, the general in this chapter because he's like demanding of... Thorn and then Thorn kind of he looks very mad and but at the same time he just sort of like meekly leaves the room with his tail between his legs because he still is like underneath the general and he has no say in really talking back to him. Same with Luke. Luke seems like very like weak at this point hit the physical description of him and then you know later on when we are dealing with the general sort of summoning this army as he describes like the kind of troops he's going to bring forth he kind of uh insults the work that Luke has put in. He says, uh, soon, the general said, I will show you, Luke, soldiers that will make your army from that little boat look insignificant. Luke clenched his fist. I've spent a year training my forces. When the Princess Andromeda arrives at the mountain, they'll be the best. Ha, the general said, I don't deny your troops will make a fine honor guard for Lord Kronos, and you, of course, will have a role to play. I thought Luke turned paler when the general said that, but under my leadership, the forces of Lord Kronos will increase a hundredfold. We will be unstoppable. Behold, my ultimate killing machines. This is a very funny thing, too, because this is an incredibly intense monologue that he has. And then what what emerges when they put these creepy tooth... Okay, so, like, basically, his underling sticks some teeth into some flower pots, basically, and then they water it with, like, a little watering can. And then what emerges but a bunch of kittens? (laughs) Little baby kittens. Ah, uh, no, kittens. I'm horribly allergic to kittens. Choo, choo. When I first read this, again, after many years, I thought the joke was going to be like, oh, they're kittens, but then, like, you get close to them, and all of a sudden, like, they rip your effing head off, like the bunny in uh, Holy Grail. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, It's funny. I just went to a cat cafe yesterday, so I'm just, like, imagining all the adorable kittens from there just being like, mew. He's like, kittens, like, angrily. <laughs> The general roared, what is this, cute, cuddly kittens? Where did you find those teeth? The general just looks at it, this is a catastrophe, and everyone just like, laughs because he doesn't understand the pun that he just made. Yeah, he's like, oh, you need Tyrannosaurus teeth. So I guess the Tyrannosaurus is supposed to be actually a dragon in this? That's like the implication of the lore going on here. All of a sudden, you just hear like the Jurassic Park theme starts playing. Do, 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 do. Yep, life finds a way. Yes, they're going to be Brachiosaurus and Gallimimus, even though I don't think uh, we're not going to have Dilophosaurus because that doesn't exist. Weird thing happens. They put in these spooky dragon teeth, and then I thought that just dragons would appear, but for some reason they're like skeletal dragon army. They're not really dragons. They're like these soldier creatures. It's hard to describe them. I guess they're zombies, right? Like that's what isn't the name of the chapter, but they're... They're not quite that either. B, it's obvious. You know what they are? They're Dovahkiin, dragonborn. <laughs> like, when it comes to the description of these creatures, like, I love the idea of, again, they're, they're like these super buff commando dudes. They have, like, camo pants and no shirt. Yeah, they sound like, um, like G.I. Joe characters. <laughs> so, in my head, when I'm thinking about this, because I like to put things, I'm thinking of them either looking like Arnold in Terminator or Arnold in 
uh, Commando. Like, for I only get, like, Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's the only person I want to be this character. But, like, Arnold in his prime, like, you know, Mr. Universe. And uh, the cool thing about these creatures, though, you know, their faces glow like you can actually, like, see their skeleton. It reminds me of the cover of uh, Thinner by Stephen King, which is a really great movie. But it's the same thing of, like, you have, like, this composite shot of a a person's face, and then the other half is the skeleton, which is so cool. Yeah, it's a creepy description. They're kind of zombies, but they're not really, like, any zombies that you would, you know, imagine, like, Night of the Living Dead or something. It's, like, a different kind of zombie. So when it comes to zombies, there's many different kinds. There's obviously, you know, the voodoo zombies, which is just a person that has lost control of his mind. Uh, again, there's also the George Romero zombies, which is, you know, you got to shoot them in the head. They're coming to get you, Barbara. There's other zombies such as, you know, running zombies, the walkers. It's one of those things where if we're looking at like ancient Greek zombies, obviously they're going to be something. What's scarier in a human body than the skeleton? You have a skeleton inside you right now. Ooh. Because we have technically seen skeleton army before, and that was with Hades and like his minions of the dead and having those different army people. But this one's different because obviously they're dragons, but again, you can't just have like a giant flapping dragon in the middle of Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's like doesn't really fit with the mythology of this like specific urban fantasy thing that I think Rick Riordan's trying to paint. So he like makes them soldiers instead. Um, I'm just gonna read the description that they give because it's really creepy. Um, As he said that skeletons erupted from the ground. There were 12 of them, one for each tooth the general had planted. They were nothing like Halloween skeletons or the kind you might see in cheesy movies. They were growing flesh as I watched, turning into men, but men with dull gray skin, yellow eyes, and modern clothes, gray muscle shirts, camo pants, and combat boots. If you didn't look too closely, you could almost believe they were human, but their flesh was transparent and their bones shimmered underneath, like x-ray images. One of them looked straight at me, regarding me coldly, and I knew that no cap of invisibility would fool it. This is where I get the idea of Rick Ryden's like writing this and he's like, oh my God, I just wrote the Greek Terminator. He basically did. Where there, there are these like unstoppable killing machines that don't need to eat, don't need to sleep. All they need, they're like bloodhounds. Like, as long as they have that scent, they will come after you until the day you die of old age. Which is like a very creepy concept, which we'll get into at the end of the chapter. Basically, um, so we know that if they get the scent of like a specific target, then they'll follow it like to the ends of the earth. And what they're trying to do is give the scent of Zoe because they have like one of like the sort of sashes or something from the hunter's uniform. Which would be funny if it turns out like they have the wrong scent. They have the wrong person. Uh, yeah, I could easily see that being a mistake. And they, they like look at it. It's like it's written down and it says Sarah Connor. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, totally. I But instead... What happens is Percy's like, oh, no, I have to, like, stop this from happening. So he kind of jumps out, and then they realize that there's an intruder. But before he's able to escape, they grab a chunk of his clothes and smell it, and then they realize, like, oh, he has... His scent is now with these, like, evil dragon super soldiers, so they're going to pursue him to the ends of the earth, and then, like, that's how the chapter ends. It's, like, horrifying. I'm, I'm just going to actually read this passage because it's horrifying. Um, An intruder, the general... Uh, growled. One cloaked in darkness. Seal the doors. It's Percy Jackson, Luke yelled. It has to be. I sprinted for the exit, but heard a ripping sound and realized the skeleton warrior had taken a chunk out of my sleeve. When I glanced back, he was holding the fabric up to his nose, sniffing the scent, handing it uh, around to his friends. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. I squeezed through the door just as the guards slammed it shut behind me. And then I ran. And like, that's how it ends. It's horrifying. (laughs) Especially be with the line of dialogue they gave about how, oh yeah, these can't be defeated by like mortal weapons, demigod weapons. Or god weapons or anything. Like they're just indestructible creatures that don't need any food source or rest or anything. They're just like destroying machines. Now that begs the question, B, why didn't Kronos get this guy sooner? And why hasn't he just risen an army? Like all he needs to go to is like Arlington because they're in D.C., and then just, plant some teeth. Yeah, just teeth. plant teeth. Like, have, like, a whole, like, mobile growing station. Just go out to the middle of, like, Seattle somewhere. Because that's, that's all pretty much hippies, communes, and farmlands. And just <laughs> just start growing this army. It's it's like in Star Wars with the clone army. Like, why don't you just keep pumping out clones? Because that means you don't have people to worry about. Yeah, it kind of is silly that they would, like, limit themselves. I guess it's hard to find the teeth, maybe? That's their limit? But also, why'd they go all the way... 
I have so many questions. Why'd they go all the way to D.C. when there are definitely also dinosaur teeth in the Natural History Museum in New York? And then, again, if if those of you who don't know, those, like, dinosaur displays that you see in museums, those aren't they're real fake. bones. Those they're, are castings. Cast- yeah, because this is going to be surprising to a lot of people. They don't find full intact skeletons of dinosaurs. They just find, like, bits and pieces, and they have to fill in the gaps. Also, like, fossils aren't really bones anymore. They're just... They're stone. Yeah, they're stone that that fossilized. It's like it was a mold of a bone that, like, disintegrated over time and then was replaced with minerals and then became a fossil. Like, it's not actually the DNA. (laughs) Unless it's, like, a mythical creature. I think that was kind of like people didn't realize that T-Rex teeth are pretty much the same thing as dragon teeth. They're almost, you know, Mm -hmm. hand in hand. Even, like, this is just mumbo-jumbo stuff, but... uh. Like, when it comes to, like, even getting DNA from a dinosaur, like, you know, a mosquito in amber. Dinosaur DNA. (laughs) You get dino DNA. DNA has got some expiration date. Like, after a while, it doesn't really work. Yeah, so there's this is about as many plot holes as Jurassic Park has. It doesn't fully make sense. Um, But B, they spared no expense. If they maybe, I don't know, found some preserved in amber dinosaur blood or something <laughs> maybe that would make sense now i'm just imagining the general is just john hammond he's just studying that who dinosaurs jurassic park yeah um so that's there's not really a lot of logic behind why if you planted these teeth that they would bring soldiers about this is i have a lot of questions i'm trying not to poke too many holes in it it is a kid's book that's like mythological or whatever i like how we're trying to apply logic to greek mythology but i think the point i'm trying to get is if you have such like a big massive army like this, why don't they use it more rather than Luke's like wimpy four? I mean, maybe the general's actually kind of right here. It's like I have the best army. Yours kind of sucks because they can die. Mine can't. Yeah, I mean that's a fair criticism. I think. Would you rather have Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator, or would you rather have John Connor, who is very squishy and easy to kill? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. It's a fair criticism. <laughs> Pretty sure super soldiers are the better option. The indestructible super soldiers. <laughs> just, you know, just my two cents. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things. I like it because, again, for me, I love having horror in literature. And this is like a great villain. And this is like a great spooky moment because it's like, how can you kill someone that can't be killed? Yeah. You have to figure out their weakness, I guess. There must be a way to kill them, though. I, m- I imagine that there has to be something. Every zombie has a weakness. You either got to shoot it in the head, you got to either burn it, uh, dismember it, do all these things, unless it's Return of the Living Dead, and then you're like completely like up poop creek without a paddle, because uh, in that movie, like you shoot them in the head, they're still going to come after you, you dismember them, their parts are individual, and if you burn them, their ashes go into the sky and create clouds and rain down on graveyards and create more dead people, so, yeah. That's that's how they get you. (laughs) Return of the Living Dead is like one of my favorite zombie movies because they apply Night of the Living Dead logic where you got to shoot him in the head and do all these things. And they do it and the zombies coming after this guy and says, it worked in the movie. Well, it didn't work in the movie. You're telling me the movie lied? Yeah. So I'm kind of interested to see how they're going to deal with these supposedly indestructible um, super soldier characters because there has to be something that is their weakness because otherwise it's just going to be like this useless stalemate of them fighting and then being like, okay, I can't ever beat you. So what Percy needs to get is he needs to get all five infinity gems. Yep. Mm -hmm. He's got to get a gauntlet. I'm sure it's something like that. I'm sure it's like some sort of like ancient, like lore thing that he has to work together with the rest of the group to try and figure out how to fight these things. Cause they have his scent now too. So they're going to be pursuing them the whole time. Or maybe, it's something so stupid, like their weakness is water, like in yeah, like in science. science. <laughs> <laughs> they go outside and it starts to rain, and he's like, "God darn it!" <laughs> so in science, like this is like a little bit of a rant about having stupid weaknesses. Like once again, aliens travel billions of light years, and they can't get past wooden doors and water. Yep. I mean, at least in War of the Worlds, like, they're, the downfall of the Martians like viruses, is right? disease. Yeah. Yes, because they didn't understand, they don't understand what, like, diseases are. Yeah. It's just one of those things where it's going to be either be a stupid weakness or it's going to be something so mythical. 
Right. It's like, oh, they're supposedly indestructible. But yeah, I have a feeling they might have like a really silly kind of weakness or it's going to be a weakness that like Percy has to work together to like find some sort of specific object that's like in like ancient mythological lore that you need to like collect or assemble in some way in order to defeat them. So what you're telling me, B, is everything has an Achilles heel. Yep. That is what I'm telling you. Exactly. (laughs) It's all going back to Greek. I love it. I love it. So B, what is the name of the next chapter? The name of the next chapter is I Break a Few Rocket Ships. <laughs> what is that supposed to mean, B? He's headed to the Air and Space Museum to find his pals. And in the wake of being sniffed by a super soldier who has his scent, um, and then he's, you know, hot on his trail. There's probably gonna be some sort of chase scene situation of him trying to like explain what's happening and also being pursued. By these soldiers so that's um gonna be stressful and we'll see how that goes i think that's basically what the next chapter is going to be is him being pursued trying to hide and then also trying to convey all the information he learned via reconnaissance to all of his friends slash the hunters who aren't really his friends i see a lot of like shenanigans in the air and space museum or it's going to be something like thalia hops on the wright brothers plane and like flies around there's nothing better than having an environment that's set somewhere that's either like a museum or something where you can have cool set pieces such as a theme park or going to a museum with a lot of like historical objects. That's true. And it's like, I think it's the where he takes like a setting that we have a certain idea of and then he infuses like a weird scene into it. It's like the fight with the chimera on the top of the St. Louis Arch. It's, you know, it's taking these like landmark things and then adding in like this mythological element that is totally recontextualizing it. And I think that that's funny and interesting to like imagine, you know, like these soldiers like crashing through the air and space museum, like knocking over bombs and stuff. And obviously because of the mist, people aren't going to see any of this stuff. Percy Jackson's going to be beating up these big macho guys with a baseball bat or a pen. So who knows what they're actually going to be seeing. Or it's going to be like one of those things. It's like, little did you know, the Wright brothers were actually demigods and the propellers are actually made out of celestial bronze. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's generally what's going to happen. There probably isn't going to be, like, too much room for exposition in the next chapter because he's going to be, like, really being immediately pursued by these soldiers who are, like, right there. And he just literally, they close the door on him. But, like, other than that, I think they can see him. So. The only other way, like, looking at this chapter, this is also a great idea for a chapter, like, in, like, Cape Canaveral where Percy Hasley is on, like, the launching pad of a rocket's about to take off and that might be one of the things it's just like fires the purest form of death or they launch him on the space b yep oh my god yeah other than that i really don't know what to predict um because i know that they're probably going to follow these threads about what, what the deal with the soldiers are and what's the deal with the general and what's happening with chronos and luke and why he looks so sickly and um exactly what What's his name? Uh, Dr. Thorne was talking about with like how he wanted to seek revenge, but there's some vagueness there. They still need to help Annabeth. They still need to help Artemis. There's a lot going on. Including the idea of Zoe Nightshade and why she's so important, because this chapter, even though it isn't about Zoe, it's all about Zoe, because Dionysus brought something up. The general brought something up about her. That's true. We get little hints and pieces about who she is as a person. Um, and yeah, there's just like a lot actually that you have to keep in mind. There's also the the prophecy. You have to remember that someone's going to die, but we don't exactly know what the circumstances of that are going to be. So there's there's a lot going on. I don't know if we're going to get a whole lot of information next chapter because, I, again, I think it's going to be mainly like s- some sort of like chase scene, but I could be wrong. I like the idea, you know, the, the crutch of having these immortal beings following Percy to the ends of the earth because they can't stay stationary for too long. Yeah, I like that as a plot detail. I think that that works in a lot of, like, adventure stories where it's, like, a group of friends and they're trying to escape these, like, you know, monsters or whatever that have, like, for some reason the ability to find them, so they're kind of constantly on the move. It actually reminds me a lot of the the horror movie It Follows because it's just this, like, idea where you you can't rest on your laurels for too long because it'll always pursue you. Yeah, that movie's really good, especially the movie Lights Out where uh, you can't be in the darkness or the monster's going to get you. Which every time you see a piece of darkness in that movie, you just like hold your breath. Yeah, that's like a really creepy kind of stressful idea of like this sort of, you know, persistence predator that's like constantly following you and you can't really ever rest for a minute. Um, So that's going to be an interesting dynamic to this story where they can't ever stop. 
See, that's why I really enjoy the movie Predator. It's just about a bunch of like super macho dudes, like the epitome of macho. Uh, and they get so scared to the point of where they're just shooting in through the mm-hmm. woods because they don't know what's coming after them. And one by one, they get picked off to the point of where, you know, Arnold has to like fight off the Predator with just sticks and stones. And it's like one of those scary things because even in like our in, in our brains, our reptile brains, the idea of something following us, because so like, everyone has like those feelings of, uh, you know, there's something watching you. And like you always like turn around and you have like that weird sixth sense. Like uh, I actually have a really good story about that. I remember coming home at maybe three in the morning because I was, just got off work and I had this weird, weird feeling that something was watching me. I am about to open my door. Oh, jeez. I turn around and there's this just gigantic husky behind me. Oh, <laughs> it was a pupper. It was a, a wolf a few times removed. <laughs> yeah, but it was like it was like silent as the grave. But you have like those weird feelings like something's following you. And I'm just like, oh, thank God. I thought you were a murderer. And all of a sudden, the husky just pulls out a knife. Oh. Pulls out a knife. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, mean, that's kind of what humans are good at is, I mean, the reason that we're a successful species is because we're good at, like, you know, detecting when we're being pursued. Um, So it's going to be, yeah, a creepy, interesting story to see Percy try to be like, all right, you guys, so um, I want to help you. I'm on this quest, even though you told me not to. Also, I'm a real... uh, sort of detriment to your quest because my specific scent has been smelled by this like army of 12 indestructible soldiers. Folly's just like Percy Jackson you idiot. Just like face palms like Percy you should have stayed home and gone home to your apartment with your mom and just hung out. Well I mean there's only one place that Percy would be safe and that would be to go back to Camp Half-Blood because they can't get through the barrier. Unless they can. I don't know. I actually don't know what rules apply to them but yeah that's the only thing I could think of. I'm looking forward to see what happens with this. I'm this is the kind of like villain slash monster whatever that really creeps me out. Like the idea of constantly being pursued. So I think because a lot of times the monsters so far that we've encountered, they, I don't find them particularly creepy. They're very cartoony, but this is like very creepy to me. The idea of like having like a monster that follows you, like places that you who like you feel the safest. Like good examples, Freddy Cougar. He gets you in your dreams. Everyone has to go to sleep. Yeah, exactly. So it's everyone has to stop at some point, and that's kind of the case here where it's. Percy can try to run, but he can't hide. Like, he'll he'll keep moving, but I feel like these creatures or whatever are going to find him somehow, so he has to figure out a way to defeat them, but I don't know what that's going to be. And we will find out hopefully soon. So, B, do we get any messages this week? Uh, Yeah, we got a, an iTunes review. Five stars from Dragons for Darwin, I think it says. Uh, love it. I love this book series, and I like how you guys go chapter by chapter, uh, but when you finish the first series, are you going to read the next series? Yep, probably. Yep, that's the answer. Yep. Uh, we, we've we been getting that a lot, and once again, we're going to keep going until we run out of books. It's a nice comfort to know that people keep asking us, like, are you guys going to do the next series? I'm like, yes, yes, we are. Don't don't worry. Because we're going to, so I'm glad that there's people who want to hear that. <laughs> yes, we're, we're, we're glad that people are thinking, like, six years ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> when we're a billion years old, when we finally finish this podcast. Um... B, I'm like 85. I think we're in the last Percy Jackson book, Percy Jackson and the Mythical Retirement Home. <laughs> Where Percy Jackson's like 102, and he's just like, his adventure is him getting applesauce in the bingo hall. Uh, So we actually got two shout-outs. We got two Patreon... Yeah. We did get actually two new people for our Patreon, so thank you so much. Which is so awesome. Thank you, guys. Lycon. I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. L-Y-K-A-O-N. Lycon, I want to say. And then we have another one from Nuno Diaz. Thank you so much for those wonderful Patreon subscriptions. Uh, helps keep the lights on, and we really love you guys. Um. So do you want me to read... One of our emails. So yeah, we got um, an email from Sean who says, Hi guys, my name is Sean. You probably won't read this, but I love your podcast and the series. We're reading it right now. Oh, yes, yes, we are. My older dog's name is Hercules and my small dog's name is Zeus. I think you're amazing and awesome people. Fun fact, my uh, my dog Otis had a golden retriever, Otis, and his, his dog dad's name was also Zeus. It's a good name for a dog. I'm a child of Zeus and I love D&D art. And reading. Please don't stop your podcast. I listen to it every night to get to sleep and always wake up to good morning campers. P.S. Zach, your friend sounds like YouTuber Dingo Doodles. I didn't know their name to keep this top secret info secret. Um, 
I'm not the YouTuber, but thank you. We have a confession to make. They aren't dingo doodles. No. Yeah. Not a YouTuber. But thanks. Anyway, I I watched one of their videos and it's funny, but not me. So we got an email from Oliver. Hi, my name is Oliver, and I think you should make like a Kane Chronicles bonus episode or maybe make it a part of the podcast from Oliver. Uh, yeah, that's another book series by Rick Riordan. We're, we're on the list. We haven't decided yet if we're going to do Heroes of Olympus or the Kane Chronicles next. It's like one of those things. Yeah, where it's not like, sure. It kind of splits off, I think. I don't exactly know what the plot entails of each, so. So they do branch off. Some of them connect, some of them don't. Like, I don't want to really spoil it. Like, in a very, like, vague, vague way. Uh, we could either do it as Heroes of Olympus, or we could just do it by publication date, which would be uh, King Chronicles, then Heroes of Olympus, and then so on and so forth. Uh, we have plenty of content. Like, don't worry if you think that we're not going to do the King Chronicles. We're going to do one or the other first, and then we're going to do the next one. So either way, you'll get what you want eventually. <laughs> yes, it just takes time. Patience is a virtue. Yeah, because we're going to be doing chapter by chapter with all of these, so it's going to take a minute for us to get to the uh, next series. But either way, we're gonna we're gonna do both probably. Do we get any other messages? Uh, yeah, and then th- it's so funny. There seems to be a theme with the messages we're getting. Um, another message from Nuno who says, uh, "Hi Zach and B, I've just found your podcast, which I'm already binging while also rereading the books. I didn't know if this is something you have discussed in episodes after the one I'm at, but I want to just point out that there is a follow up collection." to the Percy Jackson series, The Heroes of Olympus, which is, in my opinion, even better with more grown and diverse characters, while also having the original trio. There's even a follow-up series to the follow-up series called The Trials of Apollo, which is also amazing. However, as a new fan, I would just like to say that I would love in the future to hear you review the House of Hades book. There's a lot of suggestions coming our way. Yes, and all my golden advice is we'll get to it eventually. Just be patient. Yeah, that's so funny. It seems like all of our messages are about um, different books we're going to do. We're going to follow up on them. We'll figure it out. We're, we're going to try to map out which ones we're going to do first, but we'll get to it. It goes to show like our, when it comes to our fan base that people are really passionate about like the Heroes of Olympus or the other book series. And they, they just want us to really talk about it. Like We're going to get to it. It's like one of those things where you know eventually we'll get to it because we have to read Percy Jackson to branch out to the other ones. You can't really go uh, the other book series because, unfortunately, Percy Jackson and the Olympians is kind of like the tree that holds up the leaves. Yeah, so I don't exactly know enough about the plot to know exactly which book we're going to do next, but or what what series we're going to do next, but I don't know. I'll defer to Zach because I'm sure he has a better idea of what would make sense, but either way, we'll, we'll get to it. I know which one that I would love to do, but mm-hmm. we have to we wait. We have to wait because we have other ones. Sucks. Yeah, so we have to kind of follow the plot a little bit more. But, you know, we'll see. It's one of those things where it's the Rick Riordan literary expanded universe. Plus, there's all the other books, like the Rick Riordan Presents books. Like, I don't know. Like, there's, there's so much that we could do that my head's going to explode. Pop. I believe that is everything that we have for this week. Thank you so much for all the wonderful messages. We really appreciate it. Thank you. There's, it's so funny. The theme is, is you know, people wanting us to continue doing the show. So I'm happy that that's the thing, that you guys are interested in us continuing to do this thing because um, we are going to for the foreseeable future. Oh, this is really awkward. But I'm actually, I got an invitation to go to Mars for the rest of my life. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. You're going to wear a helmet? You're just going to kind of just explode up there. Oh, no, no, no. There's going to be like a, a place where I'm just going to bring all my Percy Jackson books and I'll have a good time. Maybe we'll we'll still somehow be able to like record our show. It's just going to have to be like a, a three-year time difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wanted to um not only give a shout out to our two new Patreon subscribers, but also remind people that if you do $10 a month that I, we're still doing the pin thing. So far, we don't have any $10 a month patreon patrons but that's that's still on the table it's gonna be a cool design very percy jackson looking i'm probably gonna post um like a sort of preview design on twitter sometime soon so you guys kind of have an idea of what you'd be getting uh if you subscribe at that level so just a just a reminder five we also appreciate five or one dollar or whatever you want to do at that time because even just you know a dollar a month you get access to all the cool bonus stuff that we've been doing Yes, any any dollar helps as well as, you know, just keeps the lights on. We can buy new equipment soon, uh, just pay for the hosting space. Surprisingly, the one thing people don't realize about podcasting is, is the hosting space does cost some money. 
even though it's it's free to you guys for us it's it's our passion project and you know you you spend money to do it and it's totally it's fun to either support or just get the word out about our show uh one thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a t-shirt design contest so if anyone wants to make a design for any of our jokes such as horse and around or you know keep staying mortal or any of those things horse and around. <laughs> Yeah, because we want to have a little bit more merch options for you guys. We we love that you know we have our faces on everything, but it'd be fun to have your guys' designs on some t-shirts and designs. Yeah, probably b- would be best to email those instead of tweet them or anything because they might get kind of like lost in the shuffle. But definitely, if you email those to the regular Camp Half Blood email and like put like in the subject line something about it being a like t-shirt contest t-shirt whatever so we could be able to find it so just put in the subject line t-shirt contest and the best designs uh we will compile and we'll let the community vote i'm sure it'll be pretty difficult to pick because you guys are really funny and all the fan art that you send us like has me in stitches every time that i see it so um it's gonna be rough to narrow it down but for sure we're gonna try to pick one of those and that would be so cool because I really want to get a horse and around t-shirt now. Other than that, B, I think it's that time of the day again where we, you know, wrap our mics up and we turn off the radio station for a little bit. Yep. Though we do have a very exciting episode coming very soon because we're recording another one today. But I don't know if we're keeping that on the down low for now. But all I'm going to say is that I had to listen to an, a particular album of a yep, that's... magical boy. He goes on a magical, magical adventure quest. with his magical yep. friends. Mm-hmm. So we're going to... We'll leave it at that. I hope you guys uh, enjoy that episode. Also, our um, our one year anniversary is that n- today? Hold on, what's okay? It's not yet. It's in, in eight days. So our first episode came out on February eighteenth, twenty eighteen. So today is the tenth that we're recording. So yeah, um, we're we're coming up on that. That uh, would when is this episode coming out? Would this be soon enough for people to still submit stuff for that? Yeah. Yes, well, you should still be able to submit in time. Yeah, so please get your submissions in. We'd really appreciate that. You can, you can email us at radiocamphaplet at gmail.com. We also have a toll-free number, which will be down in the show notes because it's very long and people kept getting confused on it, so we're just going to leave it down. So if you want to call that, it's a toll-free number. You're not going to be charged for it. We don't even get your phone number. We just get the voice messages. So B, where can they find you? You can find me on Tumblr at twinpoetry.tumblr.com as well as Twitter and Instagram at B. Kelly Gorman. And if you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Suda41. That's S-U-D-A-4-1. If you want to follow our show on Twitter, that's at Halfblood underscore radio. If you want to email the show and send us any more Iris messages such as suggestions for books, uh, messages about how much you like our show, things that you know we want to correct us about, anything at all, even like, how's our day? We're, we're all doing pretty good. Uh, you can email us at radiocamphaplet at gmail.com. You can also go to our store page at T Public. So just type in Radio Camp Half Blood, and you'll be able to find some wonderful t shirts. We're going to be having some hopefully new designs soon. So please, uh, if you want to submit to that t shirt design contest, just go to radiocamphaplet at gmail.com. And then the subject line, just write contest. And at the end of the month or whenever we get enough submissions, we're going to put it on Twitter and we're going to have like a nice vote. Uh, we also have a Discord channel. There's going to be a link down in the show notes below. It's a long stream of numbers and I don't want to say it right now because it's easier just to click it, join it, join the community. Uh, we're thinking of possibly doing like a Reddit page. That might be something that we might be doing. Who knows? Well, I think that that's kind of it. Be We have to put out uh, you know, our security minotaur for the night. Yep, I think it's time to wrap it up. Um, yes. Say goodbye. Try not to get any uh, super soldiers. Get your scent. <laughs> oh, too late, B. There's already one at the door. Oh, no. They're already on their way. Oh, no, I hear them knocking on the door. <laughs> oh, oh, thank God. It's just Arnold Schwarzenegger. I-, I liked you in True Lies. Well, I'm Zach. I'm B. And keep staying mortal. Bye, guys. Bye.